Goddess Kring Radio. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Hey, this is Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring podcast. And I wanted to talk about what's going on. I have a lot of anger and fear. And there's a certain dynamic in my family that I am trying to overcome. I have a bit of an issue with my boundaries and I'm thinking, okay, if you're around somebody in your family or just a friend or a stranger and they are doing something or saying something that you think is abusive or mean or cruel or inappropriate or harmful to you in some way, it's easy to think of that person as a bad person or blame that person or accuse that person of doing something wrong. And it could be that they are doing something that's wrong or inappropriate. But as an adult person that wants to heal, such as myself, I'm thinking that I would like to try to flip that around and not blame myself when someone else treats me in a way that I don't like, but take responsibility for allowing them to do that. Because all my life, I have had certain people I feel like they push me around and maybe that's why I love that. Maybe that's why a lot of people like that Tom Petty song, I Won't Back Down. You can stand me up at the gates of hell, but I won't back down, going to stand my ground, etc. Because I think a lot of people need to hear that message. People that are sensitive, Tom Petty is a highly sensitive man as far as I can tell. A lot of artists, most good artists actually are highly sensitive doesn't being sensitive doesn't mean that you're nice it means I think some people think being sensitive means you're nice no sensitive doesn't mean you're a wimp or that you're nice sensitive means that you're just highly affected you notice things subtle things that other people don't notice or maybe you're just more affected if you hear music or see a bird or hear a bird sing you just notice things visually or the smell, the senses, the, the touch, the sight, the vision, the smell, the sound, all of the senses are a little bit more able to sense. And so when you're sensitive, it means that you can get easily overwhelmed. And so basically, I am a sensitive person. My parents are both pretty sensitive. And I was kind of raised, you know, our nervous systems basically are pretty sensitive. So there's, there's aspects of my family that are not healthy, in my opinion. And so part of that is my responsibility, because I'm 48 now, and I'm an only child of parents who divorced when I was four. And I used to think that it was pretty much okay. And now I'm realizing some of the dark sides more clearly of my family dynamic. So there's some boundary issues between my mom and me and my dad and me, and maybe all three of us separately. I think that if they had uh, not had me, they would have completely lost touch as human beings. And so the only reason why they communicate now, because they really don't get along very well, is because of me, because they had me. And so now that they're heading into their 70s, uh, there's certain things to do with as they age, you know, what their wishes are with their wills, with their finances. They're both in very different places financially, and they're aging differently. And I know that I'm an only child, so I'm kind of dreading what's going to happen. I think one of my parents is going to need my help and not want to go into a nursing home, nor are they able to afford a nursing home. And then another one of my parents is financially doing pretty well and has a plan and probably is actually psychologically looking forward to having other people help take care of them. So in old age, like a nursing home kind of situation. So both my parents have very different opinions and ideas about what they want when they're elderly and when they need help. So I'm kind of like nervous about that and bracing for that since again, I'm an only child. So there's no siblings that I can ask, you know, to help me deal with this. And you know, both my parents are actually very healthy right now. They're both very physically and mentally still doing well. Um, So Maybe I won't have to make some of these choices for quite a while, but 
I'm not sure, but I need to know what it's like to stand up for myself and, and assert myself and say what I want and what I don't want. I've always had a trouble and felt like my job was to not have needs. And I feel a lot of shame about having needs. So I know that might sound very strange to some people that don't have my issues, but I have just lots of issues because as a child, I think I suppressed myself and I think I still do that. So the same things that, that help you survive as a child in certain families are the same things that actually are really bad for you to continue doing as an adult. And it's kind of embarrassing that I'm 48 and I, I've been in therapy for like 25 years off and on, and I already know this stuff on an intellectual level, but emotionally, I, it seems like I'm very slow to actually put this into practice. So I need to figure out, I love that Tom Petty song, I Won't Back Down, because of that is that people need to learn to stand up for themselves and not to be violent towards other people and yell at people and be macho, but to say, hey, hey, I don't want to talk about that, or hey, you're making me feel uncomfortable. This is not appropriate. I don't want to discuss this. And say what you need and say what you want. So I have to do this with one of my parents, actually with both of my parents, but one parent in particular triangulates and tells me things about my other parent that are very negative and that is this person's way of interpreting it, but it's not the same way that I see the reality. So I'm entitled to my opinion and my version of reality. And this other person is invading my space. And so I am trying to say this in a respectful way. So <laughs> to be honest with you, it is my mother. So it's my mother that I have to have much stronger boundaries with. In some ways, you know, things fluctuate and her mood changes and she has the higher self spiritual wisdom archetype within her. And then she also has the more angry, judgmental, gossipy, um, fear-based type reaction type phase. And she is in a, a process of grief. So I don't want to say a whole lot because that's personal and private. But let's just say one of my parents and I have a bit of a boundary issue. And now that I'm 48, I'm really feeling it because I'm, I'm sad that in some ways my life is not really, not really, like I just feel like a lot of people say, you're so young for your age, which actually they mean it as a compliment because I look fairly young for 48, but I also kind of act pretty young for 48. So I feel like in some ways I'm not very grown up and not very mature, but then again, I need to give myself credit. So I'm just talking about boundaries right now. I would like to learn how to, instead of reacting and blaming my parents for treating me in ways that I don't think are good for me. It's true. Maybe they are treating me in ways or saying things to me that is not very loving at times, but it's up to me to say, Hey, back off or, Hey, I don't want to talk about this. Or, Hey, when you, when you say that to me, I don't think that's very respectful or, you know, I need to speak up for myself instead of feeling like a victim and blaming other people for whatever they're doing. So I'm just trying to figure out, like, I don't want to deny the toxicity of some of my relationships in my family. I don't want to deny that in some ways it's not healthy and there's old patterns that keep repeating. And one of my relatives actually was estranged and didn't talk to her relative for years and years. And then this person passed away. And I'm trying not to repeat that pattern. I don't think that cutting off and completely would be healthy. I feel like there's a middle ground, which is to kind of stand up for yourself and maybe not talk as much to this person. And if they start getting really emotional and, and uh, kind of stir up the pot of family mud, you know, the, the can of worms, the family can of worms, uh, it's good to not engage in the drama. I feel similar to my boundaries with watching the news. You know, if I listen too much to what Trump is doing or not doing and what all of his cabinet members are doing or not doing and all the budget cuts and all the horrible things that they want to do that are frightening, 
A lot of news stories are fixated on the negative and fixated on things that really stress us out and piss us off. And it's it's kind of designed to create drama and to manipulate. You know, part of it is actually reporting on what's actually happening. You know, the facts of what's actually happening. But part of it is also framed in a way that can trigger a response. I mean, obviously they're trying to sell products and they want to get good ratings. So the news is kind of like designed to be entertaining on some level. And humans seem to be attracted to what's negative. You know, like when you drive down the street and you see an accident on the side of the road, everyone wants to gawk at the accident. And when things are really happy and wonderful, maybe people don't notice it as much. So it's true that humans are kind of attracted to drama. So I think I need a better boundary when I listen to the news. And I feel like, you know, be careful what kind of news that you listen to and you watch. So it's good to know what's going on in the world. But it's also good to know that there's things happening that the news doesn't even talk about, like especially really positive things like people helping each other, people doing the right thing. I guess there are websites called Good News but I don't think they get as many hits as all of the negative news sites do. So that's probably why Trump gets so much media attention, maybe more so than other presidents, because he keeps creating drama and saying things that piss people off and also saying uh, macho bully type things that his fans seem to like and cheer him on for. So that's really strange. So yeah, I'm not a fan of, of bombing or gassing, and I'm not a fan of war. I'm a fan of humanitarian aid. I'm a fan of diplomacy. I'm a fan of trying to build up what you want in the world instead of trying to fight against and kill and eliminate what you don't want. So it's kind of like if you have cancer and you get radiation and chemotherapy, sometimes you probably have to do that to survive but sometimes it does more harm than good and the body actually can't survive it so I feel like doing really aggressive war type things is kind of like too much radiation and chemotherapy and perhaps building up the immune system with mega doses of vitamins and nutrition and massage and acupuncture and meditation and love and endorphins and all of the things you can do to try to build your immune system up to help you fight against a disease by being healthy, you know, is probably a smarter way to go. So I guess I'm not here to judge what every other person does on this planet. But for me personally, I feel like I want to, I serve the world better if I try to build up what's already working in the world and make the world a better place. So I want to try to do that with my family. I want to try to do that with my friends. My boyfriend and I have been having a bit of a rough spot because I've been so moody and stressed out and having to deal with some family issues. And I've been sad that that hasn't been going as well, although we're still together but I feel like we're sort of hanging from a thread, partly because of me. And so I want to take responsibility for what I'm doing to help the relationship get better or what I'm doing to make it worse. And so I want to, instead of blaming other people for not being perfect or the way that I wish they would be, I want to take responsibility for what I can do. What can I do that is better to help the situation. And then the, the other person, it's up to them to do their part or not do their part. So I can stand up to people if I think they're not treating me with respect and love. And then it's up to them how they respond. And if I stand up for my boundaries with somebody in a constructive way and they continue to harm me or reject me, then I guess I can't hang out with that person. But if I stand up for myself in a way and then they say, okay, and then they respond well to it and we have a better relationship, then I guess that worked. So that's what I want to try to do. And if I watch too much news about Trump and the war and all kinds of whatever horrible things are happening and I get really upset and freak out and lash out and get angry, that's not really going to help the world. So I am kind of on a news diet. I don't have a TV, thankfully. I got rid of my cable years ago. Oh, and then I was also thinking, so go on a media diet if you need to for your health and for your um, sanity. So, you know, that's a boundary too. If you constantly are listening to the news, 
you know, that can invade your life and your boundary. And then you end up thinking that everything in the world is messed up and that's no good. So there's so many good things happening. Like I just watched a video about gorillas that have been re-released into the wild. There was a, a father and daughter whose family has some kind of a, somewhere in England, they have some kind of a rehabilitation center for gorillas and they help injured gorillas or orphan gorillas or something. And they help, help nurse them back to health and then they release them into the wild and these gorillas after 12 years of not seeing these humans recognize them these this father and daughter went to somewhere in Africa or the jungle somewhere I don't remember where they went but they went somewhere where these gorillas were out in the wild living a natural life in a nature preserve somewhere and they recognized them and they were affectionate with them and very gentle with them because you know gorillas can like rip you apart if they're mad at you or don't trust you they can just rip you apart so they were so strong so these gorillas were very kind and gentle and loving and could obviously recognize these humans that helped them as babies so that was amazing and wonderful to see so despite whatever horrible things are happening in the world with war and violence and economic injustice there are also people out there helping plants and animals I have a particular love for plants and animals and for humanitarian people helping each other. So when I when I think about the atrocities of war and bombing and gassing and, and all of the different war things that are happening and depriving people of food and water and medicine, I also think about the animals. The plants and animals in the war-torn areas are also being harmed. You know, the, the pets, the, the wild animals, the dogs, the cats, the cows, the chickens, the goats, the horses... Uh, the trees, the olive trees, the whatever the native plants are of all these different places that are in war. I feel so sad for the plants and animals along with the humans that are being harmed by war. So uh, I love it when I hear stories about humans that are actually helping each other, helping those less fortunate, helping plants and animals survive and thrive and heal and grow despite what all the negative things are. So that's what I believe in right now for today. Just wanted to share that. Thanks for listening. This is Goddess Kring, Shannon Kringen, Hollow Earth Radio, Seattle. This podcast is once a week on Hollow Earth Radio. I think right now it's Thursdays, 3 to 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I also permanently archive this chronologically on my YouTube, Patreon, Bandcamp, Mixcloud, and Podomatic, I think. That's a new one. But I, I link this on my website, shannonkringen.com. Click on podcast. You'll see a link. I'm actually having trouble with my Bandcamp, though. I think there's only 23 of these podcasts up there. But my YouTube, Patreon, Mixcloud all have my podcasts every week. So thanks for listening. If you like my podcast, please share it with anyone. It's always free under Creative Commons, non-commercial. It's free. My photography on Flickr.com is also free to publish under Creative Commons. My name is Shannon Kringen. Thank you for listening. Introverted extrovert Touch the cactus lamp. Introverted extrovert, touch the cactus lamp. She collects spacious containers, which enable expansion of her repertoire of portals. Cocoon dragon eight figs. Look for open doors. Create luck. Collab of creating. Enhanced by Coastally. Join forces stronger than wild horses. Allow nature to create infinite intricate patterns. Infinite intricate patterns. Vast caverns of green ferns. Climb mossy cracked wall. Contrast. Lizard curly tail, arched backs prancing, human like fingernails clicking rails, human like fingernails clicking rails, human yet dry, 
four-seated flight, turquoise lavender light. This seed leads to waiting, streamlining, redefining, introverted, extrovert, touch the cactus leaf. Shannon Kringen Goddess Kring podcast on Hollow Earth Radio. And I want to just say that I am having a turning point in my thought about therapy. I just got back from a therapy appointment and we talked about boundaries and we talked about my challenges. And I think during the session, I thought I was happy with her trying to help me in the way that she was. And then I later on had a reaction. Uh, I, to make a long story short, I feel like my moods are constantly changing. Oh my gosh. And there's a loud helicopter right out my window. That's kind of annoying me. Okay. I'm trying to tune that out. I'm a highly sensitive person in some ways. Okay, which means I compensate for it by being by being highly insensitive in other ways. A lot of times, actually, when you're sensitive in one way, you're insensitive in another way, and that's a coping mechanism. I will say that I am a very complicated person sometimes, and I feel like my moods change in a diagnostic level. I have been told that I meet the criteria for borderline personality disorder in a high-functioning kind of way, OCD post-traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder is OCD, and uh, cyclothymia, which is rapid cycle mood swings, like being manic depressive, except that you're rapid cycling up and down. So you're not depressed for several days and then hyper and manic for several days. You're more like every day, up and down, up and down, up and down. And that's kind of how I am. I've been that way probably most of my life. The thing is, there is no stability on this planet. And the only thing that's really stable is kind of like a spiritual focus when you, and I'm not talking about God or Jesus or religion. I'm just talking about a spiritual awareness, kind of more like a Buddhist style awareness that everything on this planet is impermanent and our moods fluctuate and we go up and down. We get angry. We get happy. We're sad. Uh, we love somebody. Then they pass away uh, we, you know, I, I've ha I had my cat Tux for many, many years, and then he passed away. And then I had Stella for only seven years, and she passed away. And now I have Kisun, and hopefully he'll stick around for at least another 10 years, I'm hoping, because he's only about 10. I hope he lives to at least 20. I'm feeding him really healthy raw meat diet from the health food pet store. So hoping that he'll stick around for a good 20 years total. But eventually my cat Kisun will pass away and I will have to say goodbye to him and that will be sad. So then I will go through grief. The thing is, if we keep trying to find stability in things external, it's never going to work. And so I feel like one of my ways of healing and coping with my mental problems, quite frankly, is my, you know, my unstable mood situation. I might try medication again. 
I'm very, very skeptical of medication. I take ashwagandha, which is an Ayurvedic herb, which is supposed to help with anxiety and depression, and it's good for your immune system. So I've been taking that, but only one pill per day. I also eat diatomaceous earth, and I take a probiotic. So I do nutritional things like that. I also take spirulina, but those are like vitamin supplements. And so I'm thinking of, for once, trying a mood stabilizer medication, but I'm not sure if I really want to. I personally know somebody, somebody who is a sister of somebody that I know is on a certain mood stabilizing medication. Uh, somebody suggested I try that years ago, but I was too afraid. Uh, because of the very small chance of side effects, which is some kind of strange rash that some people get. But this person told me that it really helped her depression and her moods right away got better. And that was 10 years ago. And it's been helping her ever since. So I might look into trying that medication, which means I need to set up an appointment with a psychiatrist because right now I'm only seeing a psychologist with my Obamacare ACA healthcare, which is free because I'm low income. So while I still have my health care, maybe I will see a psychiatrist and talk to them about a mood stabilizing medication because I've never tried that again. Mostly what I've tried is uh, Paxil, Zoloft, Prozac. Those are antidepressants that work with serotonin. And then I tried Wellbutrin once and that helped me for a while. And then I started getting agitated. So I went off of it very slowly and gradually. Um, because it's not safe to suddenly go off these things. So I very slowly went off them and nothing happened. Nothing bad happened to me and I was fine. Uh, but my moods are definitely a problem. I exhaust myself with moods. And what kind of stabilizes me when I meditate and when I exercise, it helps me feel more stable. And what I was going to say was there was if you're attached to external things, you're going to be disappointed all the time because things constantly change up and down, up and down, up and down. But if you find peace within yourself and you focus on doing what you love, see, I feel like in order to heal, I have a really chaotic brain full of all kinds of energy. And my therapist, in fact, told me that I left six voicemails for her, which she said was too many, and it brought up shame for me. She said that I should feel free to record my voice into my cell phone and then play it for her during the sessions. I do a 60 minute podcast every single week. Maybe that's partly why I kept calling my therapist. So I won't be calling her th her voicemail anymore. She said the voicemail line is supposed to be for canceling and making appointments and not for, you know, sharing your mood of the day. So I kind of hurt my feelings and I felt rejected. Although maybe that's good because one of my biggest fears is of being rejected. I have basically, I'm ashamed of my beauty and my talent. You know how most people are mostly ashamed of their flaws and their imperfections. I definitely feel kind of like I wish I could be better and more perfect, but I also have a fear of success and a fear of being, I don't like it when other people are jealous of me. Like in tennis, for instance, I used to win tennis ma in high school. I used to win tennis matches and I would always feel guilty. Like I would start hyperventilating if I started losing a tennis match. My dad was a tennis teacher and I'm left-handed. So I'm a very good tennis player. At least I used to be when I was younger. I haven't done it in a while, but I actually really have good eye-hand coordination and I'm left-handed, which totally confuses right-handed people when you play tennis. So I basically won every single tennis match in high school except one. This one girl beat me 6060 because she was the daughter of my tennis coach in high school and she was an amazing tennis player. So she totally whipped me uh, and I lost to her. But I won every other tennis match. But what I was going to say was I would start hyperventilating if I started losing. And so that I got, I got to win, I got to win, I got to win. And so I won the tennis match and then I would look at the face of my opponent who lost to me and they would look really sad. And then I would feel guilty and ashamed that I won. So when people compliment me and tell me I'm talented, on one hand, I'm like, thank you. That's really nice of them to say I'm talented. And I do agree that I am talented. I have many talents and I don't doubt that I have talent. What I doubt is that I deserve success or that I deserve like I feel like I'm on an ego trip if I'm too confident and if I'm too successful and I just feel kind of like I've been in situations lately where I was complimented by somebody for doing something for 20 years and being really good at it 
And then my face turned red and I felt embarrassed. And like I didn't want the other people in the room to think that they were bragging about me in some kind of egotistical way, even though that obviously wasn't the case. I was just struck by how uncomfortable I felt. So the reason why I'm saying this is because I'm thinking about my mental health. And I've been struggling, you know, basically for 48 years on this planet with mood swing problems. So perhaps taking a mood stabilizing medication along with meditation, exercise, nutrition, and massage. And I might even try yoga. I'm not really very limber or flexible. And I don't want to go to a yoga class because that stresses me out to have just one more place I have to go because I'm very busy as an art model. And I also deliver groceries sometimes, but that's a very stressful job. So I only do that a few times a week at the most, sometimes only once a week. So mostly I run around all over and I model for like 20 different places all over uh, town, north, south, east, and west, Whidbey Island, Vashon Island, Bainbridge Island, all over the place, Tacoma, Shoreline, um, Burien, Seattle, you know, Everett, all over. I model in many different art schools, many different places. I'm really grateful, really happy about that. I've built that, that career up for the last 25 years. So it's mostly my full-time job and I am really busy doing that. So what I need is to find less stressful ways of taking better care of myself. So I might try a mood stabilizing medication but I'm very, very skeptical of medications. And so, but I don't wanna be totally anti-medication, totally paranoid about the pharmaceutical industry. I think I can get free medication with my health insurance, we'll find out. I have really, really good Obamacare, ACA, because I'm low income, I have Apple Care here in Washington State. So I'm gonna look into that. I feel very frustrated about my therapy session today. Maybe it's good that I had, like during the session I thought I was fine and then when I left I got really angry and cried and I had like an emotional storm. So I think sometimes with other people I'm very, very polite and I say the right thing and I say what I think that they want me to say and I act in, in a way that I think I should act. And then later on when I'm by myself, I feel like I can express how I really feel, which is partly why I actually do these podcasts because in real life, only with my mom and my dad and my boyfriend and one other friend that I have, do I really feel like I can be myself. I feel like, and ironically, sometimes on Facebook, I feel like I'm more my real self than I am out in the world in person with people. Mostly I'm very, very polite and I try to avoid relationships that are close. And I mostly just work with you know people I model for. So basically I had a delayed reaction and freaked out about my therapy session. So I'm trying to figure out if I need a break from therapy or if I need to stand up to my therapist and say, I don't like the kind of therapy we're doing. I would like to do something else or I would like to look into medication. Um, and I am just having some insights about finding my spiritual path as well as maybe taking some mood stabilizing medication, uh, working with a psychiatrist on that. But again, I'm very skeptical and very scared of doing that. So let's just figure this out. I need to trust myself and follow my own wisdom. So right now I think I need to go for a walk and pack up and go visit my mom on Whidbey Island. I have a modeling gig and I'm going to see my mom and work on my boundaries with her. And my kitty cat, Kisun, kitty kitty, is taking a sun bath in the window and he looks very beautiful. So thank you for listening, everyone. My name is Shannon Kringen. You're listening to Hollow Earth Radio, Goddess Kring podcast. So here it is. It is April of 2017 as I'm recording this. And I am going to learn as I go. So I archive this on YouTube, Mixcloud, Bandcamp, Patreon, and I think uh, Podomatic. Maybe there's a few episodes of this on my Podomatic website, which is free. It's all free. I offer my podcast, my music, and my photography for free under Creative Commons license. So just wanted to put that out there. ShannonKringen.com is my website where everything is linked or go to Hollow Earth Radio Goddess Kring and you'll see stuff about my show, this podcast show, Hollow Earth Radio, Shannon Kringen in Seattle, Goddess Kring. Thank you for listening. Be yourself. 
Be yourself no matter what they say. Intimacy chasing me, feel like it's erasing me. See, I'm working on that. Self-abandonment got me stranded again, polluted and uprooted. So there you go. And the good news is I actually took a day off. I was going to work seven days this week. Actually, today was going to be my only day off. I was going to work six days this week. I'm down to working five days this week. I took one day off so that my boyfriend and I are going to go to the Tulip Festival. We did this last year, and we both love to take nature photos. We're both really good photographers, and I tend to take more, like I lie on the on the ground, and I take uh, backlit photos and all kinds of cool photos of the textures of these flowers and reflections of myself and we're going to spend the whole day together at the Tulip Festival and then have a nice dinner in La Connor at the end of that. So I'm happy and proud of myself that I took a day off because I do have a flexible schedule and I'm very lucky. So I'm going to rejuvenate on that day and I'm going to visit my mom in Whidbey Island and rejuvenate. And I'm going to try to figure out what I can do to take better care of my mental health and my find. It's a paradox. The only way you can find stability, I think is to realize nothing is stable and you can find strength in knowing that there's like the, the blue sky I, I consider spirit the blue sky the clouds are blowing around all the time that's what the Vipassana meditation taught me that you you learn how to be equanimous because people are usually chasing after stability and security uh, we chase after things we desire and we try to run away and avoid things that we're afraid of or that are painful like rejection. We try to run away from rejection and we try to find some kind of comfort and stability. And the thing is, there really is none. There really is no stability other than the fact that there's no stability. So if you think about the sky, you are the sky, you know, the soul of you, the essence, the God, the spirit of the universe is the sky. And it's always there and it's silent and quiet, but it's stable and strong. It's always there. When I model, sometimes I feel this way. I go into a trance when I model and I feel a sense of stability and quietness. So I guess I'm meditating when I do that. When I go into that state of mind, I'm probably meditating, which means I'm in touch with something that is larger than myself, larger than my individual human self. And I'm going into a relaxed state of mind. So in losing track of time and feeling like time is an illusion anyway. So basically, I'm, I'm maybe in an equanimous state. I'm finding the Siddhartha middle ground. So basically, I want to try to practice more meditation in my life. Maybe I need to do that every day to quiet my mind and become still and centered and realize that the clouds blowing around in my sky, which is my, my psyche, my, my soul, my higher self, you know, my moods will change, my feelings and my thoughts constantly change, like clouds blowing around in the sky. But the sky is always open and and solid and stable. It's a paradox, you know, it's invisible, and yet it's always there. So open space is always there. So I might do a mood stabilizing medication. But in addition to that, very cautiously, I might try that. Since I've never tried that before, I might want to try something new and see what happens. Continue eating healthy and exercising. Maybe get a massage every week. Instead of seeing a therapist every week, get a massage every week. I know a Chinese place that's only $27, so I might be able to afford that. We'll see. So massage, meditation, mood stabilizing medication, perhaps cautiously, carefully. Take a break from weekly therapy sessions or bi-weekly or I'm mean, not bi-weekly, bi-monthly. I'll take a break from that. Focus on my spiritual awareness that there is something that's stable inside me, no matter what kind of mood I'm in. So thank you for listening. Hey, this is Shannon Kringen, Goddess Spring here in Seattle. I just had a psychiatric evaluation. Um, I'm just, I, I'm very skeptical. I've been in therapy off and on for 25 years and I'm recording this to document how I feel, which is that I'm afraid that I'm using therapy instead of to help me. Perhaps I'm using it just to rebel against my mother who doesn't believe in therapy. Generally speaking, she's more into like meditation and like 
uh, nutrition and spending time in nature and, you know, more natural type healing and try to get yourself calm and by doing things that you love, etc. common sense. So, whereas my dad is a little bit more into therapy and a little, you know, but the thing is, I need to listen to Shannon. What does Shannon want? So, part of healing is to trust myself, and part of me feels like therapy is a waste of time for me. I've already done it off and on for 25 years. Uh, I went here to see if they thought maybe a mood-stabilizing medication would be good for me. So far, the lady wants to see me again. The psychiatrist wants to see me again because she's not sure if my moods are... She thinks that it seems like I'm more full of anxiety than I am depressed or bipolar. She does not think I'm bipolar. She thinks I might be borderline, uh, slightly, you know, pretty high functioning if I am borderline, which means I have a fragile sense of self and that I'm very sensitive and that I get overwhelmed and I have tra challenges with boundaries with other people. Uh, feeling too enmeshed with other people and then feeling really distant and detached and wanting to get away from other people. So I'm not really sure what the truth is and I feel okay right now but a few minutes ago I was crying and almost wanting to quit therapy because I'm wondering if therapy is just one more thing I do to pick on myself and fixate on what's wrong with me instead of actually just doing what I enjoy in life. Um, we all have our moods so she did suggest that I get my thyroid checked again because a few years ago I had a thyroid issue and then I stopped eating wheat and my thyroid levels got better and they took me off medication. But now it might be good if I got my thyroid checked again to make sure that that's not one of my issues is having a low active thyroid. I quit eating wheat three years ago and they took me off the thyroid medication after a while because they were over treating me at that point, they said. So I want to try to figure this out. What is actually going to help me heal and be a happier person. I know that doing more of what I love, which is being in nature and being with animals and plants and loving myself and doing my artwork, those things all make me feel better. So I hope that I can really use therapy to help me and not just rebel against my mom or rebel against anyone who thinks I shouldn't be in therapy or conform to anyone who thinks I should be in therapy. I'm uh, very skeptical about medication and generally just like to do more natural remedies, but I don't want to be in denial about my problems. So I have to figure out what is the best thing for me and try to resist the urge to be self-destructive. So again, what if I'm using therapy as a way of picking my scab, you know, nitpicking on what's wrong with me instead of realizing that I'm a damn, damn good person in most ways. And I'm a very talented artist and I got section eight rent and I have a boyfriend and I have have a bunch of modeling jobs and a bunch of fans of my art. I mean, I have a lot of good things going for me in my life. So maybe just build on that instead of nitpicking on myself for what's wrong with me. Uh, my moods are kind of exhausting, but maybe that's just part of life is, you know, the ebb and flow of moods. I don't know. I know that one thing I need to learn how to do is to trust myself and not give my power away to other people. Thanks for listening. So that was something that I recorded on my Anchor website. I do these short little recordings uh, on a smartphone app called Anchor.fm, I think is what it's called. And I, I do that every day. Um, I am just had more thoughts about therapy. I think that part of what I'm worried about is that I'm nitpicking on myself. And again, using therapy as just one more way to be self-destructive and pick on myself and scrutinize myself and try to come up with what's wrong with me. And then I realize and remember why I love Temple Grandin, who talks about building up your assets and your talents and your skills instead of fixating on your deficits and what's wrong with you. So that's in regards to autistic people mostly. And according to all the doctors I've talked to, I'm not actually autistic. But what I do seem to do is repress myself for whatever reason as a child in response to the problems in my family, I seem to get in the habit of repressing my real feelings and my real needs. And I thought my job was to be quiet and independent and not need much. I think the same thing with school. I remember feeling like it meant I was stupid if I raised my hand and asked the teacher for help. So I don't know why 
I did that. Maybe it doesn't matter. For whatever reason, I thought I wasn't supposed to make mistakes and I wasn't supposed to ask for help and I wasn't supposed to be too needy. You know, I felt ashamed of my needs. And so maybe I could sense that the adults around me might be a little overwhelmed by being a parent to me. I really don't know. For whatever reason, I got into the habit of repressing myself and being kind of shy and afraid to be who I really am in front of other people, which is partly why I actually do this podcast and record my voice. I generally don't have the guts to speak in the way that I'm speaking right now into the microphone in front of family and friends, I guess. It seems to me that that's the case. I tend to avoid being close to other people and I avoid friendships. You know, I do have a boyfriend and we do share quite a lot and he knows me pretty well and I guess I do have the guts to tell him what I'm telling you. So that's a good sign. My parents mostly know who I am, bits and pieces. There's some issues there. I just know that I feel very angry and I sometimes, I think I'm okay when I interact with a person and then it's like, A few minutes later, when I'm away from that person and by myself again, then I realize, oh, I actually feel angry about the way they were talking with me, and I didn't stand up to them in the moment. I feel kind of like other people dominate me sometimes, and I don't blame the other person as much as I blame myself, or let's just say I take responsibility for the fact that I'm kind of shy and passive and quiet and introspective. And so if somebody is loud and I feel like they're dominating me, I need to, s- to speak up and say, hey, I want to talk. Can you please be quiet? Or, you know, I need to politely say something. Today, the psychiatrist seemed to think that I don't have a chemical problem in my brain in terms of being bipolar. She didn't even seem to think that I had severe depression, but she definitely said, get your thyroid checked, get your blood levels checked to make sure your blood's okay. Maybe I should also have my vitamin D level checked, but I would also like to figure out what, you know, she thinks that my biggest thing is repressing myself and that I need to learn better interpersonal skills in terms of being in touch with my feelings and saying what I want and need with other people and figuring out what I want to do with my life. So I'm going to see the psychiatrist again in a couple days And I'll see how that goes and see if I can learn something. You know, it could be that therapy is a waste of my time. Like, I am glad that I've done as much therapy as I have. But I've reached a point where I might be better off getting a massage every week and spending more time in nature and doing more artwork, maybe take a class, take a workshop, get a life coach. I don't know, something. I feel like I'm in survival mode most of the time. But the truth is, I'm doing really well with my modeling jobs. I don't know if I have the stamina to model for another 20 years. I'm 48 right now, so maybe I will just model for another 20 years and continue working with art students, medical students, deliver groceries, sell my art off and on, mostly give my art away for free. Maybe that's okay. I have Section 8 cheap rent. I'm really lucky and grateful, but I worked hard and filled out lots of paperwork and was on a waiting list for like two years or a year and a half or something. I'm very, very, very grateful. You know, I've lived in Seattle for 31 years now, and I finally have reasonable rent, which is really great. So thank you for listening. I'm just going to take this one step at a time. I told the psychiatrist I was very skeptical about medications. And I I used the reference of, you know, veterinary vets, basically for dogs and cats. They prescribe food to dogs and cats that's actually harmful, like mainstream veterinary approved, veterinary uh, uh, recommended food. And dermatologists do the same thing. They recommend lotion that actually has petroleum products in it, which isn't good for you. That's like putting plastic on your skin. And alcohol, I've noticed they're on the shelf at the drugstore. There's there's lotion that says, number one, dermatologist recommended. And you read the ingredients and it's full of garbage that you should not put on your skin. So that's, I don't trust that. And the same thing with toothpaste that says, you know, number one dental recommended, you know, whatever brand. It's full of toxic chemicals and fluoride. I don't even use fluoride in my toothpaste. So I'm just wondering if the psychiatric, you know, pharmaceutical industry obviously is corrupt 
Although a good doctor, a good psychologist and psychiatrist actually wants the person to get better and be happy and healthy so they can feel good about themselves. So I don't want to be totally paranoid about this, but I think it's pretty naive to trust the mainstream medical industry since switching my cat to all natural, whole, raw, frozen meat diet that I get at the health food pet store, specially formulated for cats, his health is thriving right now compared to how it was when I was feeding him basically dead cooked meat in a can. Uh, and, and it was grain free, which I thought was healthy, but I noticed it had potatoes in it. Potatoes are full of carbs, not good for cats. So basically, my cat is a lot healthier. I did not do what the vet said. I, I, well, I listened to a naturopathic vet online. Her name is Dr. Karen Becker. And she has videos on how to feed a dog or cat raw meat diet in the healthy, safe way. And she talks about how in veterinary school, they don't really teach them about nutrition in the proper way. So the same thing with regular mainstream human doctors. They don't learn a whole lot about nutrition. It's really naturopathic physicians who know about the power of nutrition and how that helps your body be healthy. So basically, I need to learn how to trust myself and I'm not going to let the, the psychiatrist push me around, although she seems like a very great person and she's not a pill pusher, which I'm really glad to, to know because I'm not really a big fan of medication. I just don't want to be in denial about my issues. So I'm going to talk with her again and try to learn something and make sure she knows that I'm worried that I'm using therapy to beat myself up, which is not really what therapy is supposed to be used for. Because, you know, I don't do drugs, I don't drink or smoke or do any drugs, I don't cut myself or do any kind of mutilation the way some people do when they're abusive to themselves. I don't even binge eat anymore. What I seem to mostly do that's self-destructive is I avoid doing my art, I avoid getting a massage, and I beat myself up. Mostly I scrutinize and beat myself up. The good things I do are eat really pretty healthy. I eat diatomaceous earth and spirulina and, and vitamin D and I take a probiotic. I exercise every day. I get special artesian well water that doesn't have any fluoride or chlorine in it and I drink that every single day. I drink a lot of water. So I'm actually kind of healthy in those ways. The ways in which I'm unhealthy is that I beat myself up and I pick on myself and I doubt myself and I put myself down and I repress my feelings and thoughts and desires around other people and then I would just want to get away from them and be alone so I can relax and be myself. So thank you for listening. This is Shannon Kring and Goddess Kring on Hollow Earth Radio Seattle.
Hey, that was Portal Vortex by me, Goddess Kring, and Claxton Kent in Portland. Wish me luck. I have a second psychiatric evaluation coming up real soon. I'm not really sure if I believe in mainstream psychiatry. <clears throat> Trying to figure out if I might be a little bipolar. If I am, I'm cyclothymic, which means rapid cycle, but I never get so manic that I stay up all night and have a lot of delusional, grandiose thoughts, and I never get so depressed that I stay in bed all day. But it does seem like I have rapid cycle moods, but I might fit more borderline personality disorder, which means I have a fragile sense of self, and I'm highly sensitive, and I have a hard time saying yes and no <clears throat> in ways that are really good for me. That is a long story. I also recently wanted to read something about the American dream is a lie. The rich hoard and embezzle the money and leave the rest of us in poverty. That's something I said recently. And I think it's naive to think Donald Trump was actually voted in. And I don't believe that they actually voted him in. I think he was planted in there by the military <clears throat> industrial complex and the international mafia warlord warlords who have a lot of money and power and they want him in there to make money hoard and embezzle and drop bombs and sell weapons and do tons of war and the fact that he's allowed to continue to be an entrepreneur and his daughter as well Ivanka can continue with her Trump trademark incorporated and make money as business entrepreneurs basically using the White House as their headquarters that's pretty sleazy they're allowed to do all the Trump Incorporated, whatever they want. They can do it, and they're getting away with it. And I'm sure he doesn't pay any taxes. It's pretty naive to think that this is a democracy. I think that the mafia and the military run this country, corporation, USA Trump Incorporated. And it was like this when Obama was in, except it's just gotten a lot worse, and it's a little bit more transparent and out in the open. Although I do think that Obama was not a sociopath. Obama was a decent human being trying to make the world a better place in whatever way he could, despite some of the war and prison things that he did that I didn't like. I am happy with my Obamacare. And I recently also got some kind of um, hate mail, which was very disturbing. Somebody wrote me some horrible, um, abusive things about myself, saying that they complimented me on Facebook a few years ago. I think it was 10 years ago that I interacted with this person, and I don't know if he wanted to date me because I did not want to date him, but he did not say that. But he said some horrible things to me in an email. All of the compliments that he gave me, he meant to take back and that his my art leaves him with a bad feeling and he kind of rambled on about it in a really, really creepy way. I actually published this on my Facebook. I thought about actually saying his name, but he might have some mental illness problems and so I'm not going to say his name on this podcast. I did publish it on my Facebook just to get it out in the open. So I'm not really sure how to deal with some of that. So I'll see you next week. Goddess Kring, Shannon Kring in Hollow Earth Radio podcast. Healing reveals the dreams. Listen to your heart. Goddess Kring Radio. Shannon Kring. Goddess Kring. Shannon Kring. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring Radio. Shannon Kring. Goddess Kring. Shannon Kring. Goddess Kring. Vessel, the 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 vessel,
Without the stench of languid light, not old, 